Okay, um, I will go ahead and open uh, the meeting of uh, the Medfield Dale Street School Building Committee. Um, as we do have a quorum, just to note to the general public that this meeting is being recorded. And my favorite part of the evening, so with the Governor Baker's March 12, 2020 order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, general law chapter 30A, section 18, and the governor's March 15, 2020 order imposing strict limitations on the number of people that may gather in one place. This meeting of the Medfield Dale Street School Building Committee is, be, is being conducted via remote participation. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings as provided for the order. A reminder that persons who would like to listen or view this meeting while in progress may do so by following the instructions on the agenda and meeting notice. And just to note also that that while not stated there, that that was extended through April of next year by the governor earlier. Okay, uh, one last pass through the waiting room. Looks like Anna May is here, so with her. Okay, um, so uh, tonight's focus uh, for all is uh, budget. We wanna go through the budget in, in a lot of detail, walk through line by line. Um, I have some comments which I've shared a little bit with Lynn already, but we'll talk through them. Um, just to also a note uh, as an update before we get started, um, Jeff, uh, myself, and Tim Bonfati uh, were invited to and participated in a Warren Committee meeting last evening, which I think was a great dialogue, a lot of good questions raised, and good conversation. Um, it's not the last meeting we will have with that group by any stretch, but it was a great starter. Um, and I uh, applaud what the Warren Committee is doing in terms of setting up a series of subcommittees to really tackle every key aspect of this project and ensure that the, um, uh, the residents have confidence that they've done uh, an extensive amount of due diligence on this project. So um, uh, thank you for that. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Lynn and Gina to walk us through our agenda this evening. Uh, I don't believe we have design updates or anything from Marrow Street. I think it's really going to be budget focused tonight. Um, and the goal really to come away with this with sort of a, an established budget that we can submit for. Um, the other thing we have to do tonight is vote on the submission of the SD set to, uh, to the MSBA um, and get that all wrapped up for next week. So with that, I'll turn it over to uh, Lynn and Gina. And, and Mike, uh, just to sure. just to put a point on on your meeting last night, the you know the uh, it had it, it is open to the public and it has been uh, taped, and it and Sharon Tetro as the chairperson has uh, widely distributed, but uh, it is accessible for anyone who's on the call listening tonight uh, in the population that didn't get the. Uh, here at last evening, it is available. So just want to add that point, thanks. That's great, thanks, Bob, that, that's a good point. So Mike, before I get started, um, I will need to share my screen at some point. And I oh. don't believe I've done that before on, on the Zoom meeting. So. You should be all set, yep. Okay, well, um, I won't share just yet, but uh, first on the agenda is, um, the approval of the August 18th, um, 2021 meeting minutes should have been in your packet. And I am apologize for the packet going out late today. You should have received it earlier this afternoon. Does anybody have any comments on the meeting minutes? Um, only that I haven't had a chance to review them. So if everybody you want to table the vote to, to next. Yeah, time? I, I mean, unless anybody objects to that, um, you know, that'd be my preference, but I wasn't able to review them today. Okay, we'll yeah. table, we'll table them to next time, um, because it did go out late. Um, I don't know if same with the, we had one invoice for August, 2021, which um, basically closes out the feasibility study and schematic design um, invoicing. Uh, and that can you, was- Can you pause for a second? So uh, I'm seeing uh, Tim Bonfati in the attendee list. I'm trying to promote you, Tim, but for some reason, uh, I think you have to accept it. I'm not sure. Oh. And then he just dropped out. So maybe he's having some issues. Um, 
Oh, there oh, he is. Oh, there he is. Okay. Sorry, that was me. No worries. I just wanted to make sure you got you got in. Yeah, yeah no, uh, I was doing some work and I didn't see that. No worries. Okay, uh, Lynn, take it away. Uh, Tim, just for your um, information, we're tabling the August 18th, yes. yeah, 2021 meeting minutes. Okay. Um, and we have one last invoice for the feasibility study schematic design phase. Uh, and it's left fills invoice for $3,200. That should have been in your packet as well. And I don't know if you want to table that one or not, but um, if uh, I had one other comment, we have about 8,147 and then left field has a little bit left in their feasibility study budget, I think $1,163 roughly. Um, I know that Arrow Street is out for some traffic uh, studies for niche engineering. And um, we were hoping that next month after we've made all the all, all of the, the base contract payments to um, Arrow Street and Left Field that we could take that remaining money and um, give to Arrow Street to make them whole with niche engineering. We asked them to do some additional work that we did not do a contract amendment for. Um, and they took it out of their last invoice because the last invoice would have gone over otherwise. And now that we have this money left over after this invoice for left field, I think we have enough to at least pay for the amount that they invoiced last um, month that they had to take out of their invoice. So oh, I, I had talked this through with Lynn and I, I have no objection to that strategy um, in terms of sort of finishing out our feasibility study money by um, um, using those unexpended funds to um, clear up this uh, mix up on the uh, engineering invoicing. Yeah, and if we left it in the feasibility studying schematic design phase, MSBA would make it ineligible, whereas it's currently eligible. So we might as well use it for money that we actually spent. So if everybody's okay, they'll be with that. We'll have one more invoice next month. Um, and with that, I don't know if you want to vote to approve left fills invoice for 3,200 or not. I have no objection to uh, moving the invoice um, forward. If anyone else disagrees and wants to table it, that's fine. No, I think we should approve it. Is that a motion, Mike? Yeah, motion to approve it. Okay. Uh, we have a motion to approve from Mike Weber. Do I have a second? Second, Anna May. Second from Anna May, running down the list. Um, Jeff Marsden? Yes. Uh, Caden? Yes. Mike Marcucci? Yes. Tom Herb? Yes. Mike Weber? Yes. Tim Bonfati? Yes. Anna Mayo Shaybrook? Yes. And Mike Quinlan also votes yes. Motion carries. Hey, thank you. Uh, this will allow us to work with Air Street to, to at least uh, get some more money toward them to them for the additional traffic engineering work. Um, okay, so this brings us to uh, review of the final project budget, and I'm going to try to share my screen. Can you see that? I can't tell if you can see it or not. So. I could see your screen, but you should go to slideshow. Slide yeah. yeah. Okay, some of these slides you saw at the last meeting, but I just thought it was worthwhile to kind of recap some of this. Um, this very elaborate spreadsheet here is MSBA's template, which many of us who've been doing this for a long time still call it the uh, form 3011. They just updated it and um, the, the template that, that we're using now is the July 28th version. Um, it's very formulatic in terms of determining eligibility and reimbursement. And we're going to go through each of these categories so you'll see how some of the um, ineligible items or excluded items get um, you know, why they're in that category. Um, and then 
based on, we'll talk a little bit about the recent changes in the, the grant caps and what that means to this project. Um, our reimbursement with incentive points for um, sustainability, two points and, oops, sorry, didn't mean to do that. And 1 1.4, 1.58 points for, um, geez. Going the wrong way. <laughs> yeah, no, for um, maintenance, uh, put us up at 43.42%. But as this is falling out, our our actual reimbursement rate is going to be somewhere between 22.6% and 23.11%. And that's based on the caps that we have. Um, again, just recapping that previously, um, the caps were for OPMs at 3.5% and designers at 10%, 10% for up to whatever the construction costs were. And they have been limiting this now to $500 a square foot. Um, and as we go through it line by line, you'll see some of the things that are ineligible because we're currently at $673.34 a square foot. Uh, the caps on owner Owner's contingency was previously 2%. It's now at 0.5%, and we'll talk a little bit about that. We don't have to deal with demolition and abatement, so um, there's no issues there, and they still haven't determined what the caps are on that category will be. But the construction cost cap has gone up to $360 a square foot, but unfortunately, some of their other caps have, have um, taken away some of the gains that we received for upping the cost of um, the cost cap on construction costs. If I remember correctly though, the effective rate is very similar to where it was. It's just some of the, the, the increase in the construction cost cap is offset by the, by the, the new caps for OPM and designer, et cetera. Exactly. So, so overall, it's not a huge difference to our bottom line. Exactly. Um, so the first category up here is the feasibility study agreement. And that million dollars is what this phase that we just went through, that million dollars was previously uh, voted and funded. So even though it is included in the bottom line here, Ultimately, we will be taking that million dollars away when we ask for a vote request from the town. Um, so we'll talk about that a little bit when we get to the total at the bottom of this. For the, um, then the next line is legal fees. And Mike and I talked about um, adding some budget in here for the legal fees. Uh, yeah, that's, that's, we, you know, we standardly carry some money for legal fees. Don't, don't always use it, but um, we should be carrying something in that line item. And my suggestion was to carry 50,000. Uh, yeah, for, 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 sorry, Mike, like for what? Um, that could be for a lot of things. If, if um, there are questions that, you know, we need, we need counsel to opine on, or, um, you know, there could be things like, um, you know, spending uh spending time that you know consulting a, an, a, an attorney for freedom of information act requests or um open meeting law things um so it's basically just having some money set aside in case you know there's issues that arise that require us to consult legal counsel and i guess there's kind of two two schools of thought on this uh if you put the money in the legal fees that's where that's what you need to spend it on and when you move it, it automatically becomes ineligible. So you can either fund it from the legal fees line or you can fund it from other administrative cost line or the owner's contingency. So there's several ways to handle it if whatever we put in that category um, is not enough or too much and we have to, you know. But um, so that, my, it's been Mike's recommendation to change that and add fifty thousand dollars in that I'm, line. I'm, I'm fine. I think Lynn makes a good point about that. So I don't have a problem, Mike. If you I and mean, we normally do carry them, but she's right. I mean, those are automatically ineligible. So yeah, um, I just that was a recommendation from Jeff. You know, so um, yeah, 
you know, if you if you think otherwise, Tim, I'm fine with not doing. I think I think that's okay. a good point. As long as you're okay with it, that's that's fine by me. I'm gonna bring that on to our next project, Lynn. <laughs> <laughs> I'm um, sorry. So just to explain that to me a little bit more, the we can get some reimbursement if it's in other admin costs, but not in legal fees. Is that correct? Uh, no, they 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 won't reimburse it because it's for, it's for legal costs. But but it's it's automatically not reimbursed and reduces the grant if you put it in the budget as legal fees. Not, not as other admin, it's subject to whatever it shows up as. So. So maybe you know, we bump the other admin cost by fifty grand. Then is that? Yeah, good? I mean to be honest, we don't even we I. I honestly, we usually put like 20, I thought it was 20, 25. Mike said, Jeff Narava said 50, but you know, it's really for more, more likely it, typically it's for bid protests, bid protests or yeah. sometimes contract drafting. You know, if we feel like we need help around that, it's not for really usually turning into a big legal thing, although it's there for that. My, you know. Mike, can you just clarify that, that that was Jeff in your office and not me? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Just, we just want to be clear with that because yeah. I, you know, yeah. things happen. No, so. I appreciate that, Jeff. Thank I, you. Absolutely. So the, just to clarify, that was um, talking through with a couple of colleagues and reviewing this and seeing, you know, always getting other set of eyes on it. It was just something that um, was recommended. But, um, you know, Tim, if you're comfortable with not putting it. Yeah, no, I think that, that I, I think we should just leave it be. And okay. if we incur them, we incur them and sure. we'll move it out of that. Put it there. Sounds good. <laughs> Okay, the next category we're still working on, this is the owner project management category. And I kind of, the, the box in blue that um, represents a total of 2466060 is really what is the OPM cost. The other costs below there, which currently totals 240,000 are, are actually owner's services and we use them as needed. Um, and we are currently looking at tightening up our, our budget numbers. So we know that they'll probably be lower than what's shown here. Um, and we're, we're, we're working with Mike on that, uh, but we're currently showing what we showed you at the last meeting right at this moment. Um, I think there was some discussion about lowering the construction documents line item and potentially um, um, we're looking at who's servicing the construction contract administration line there too. So we're looking at that yeah, as well. That's where the big number is, but it's basically we're looking at, you know, the overall proposal. We're negotiating that with left field. We'll do the same with Arrow Street. They, they have their proposed numbers in here. But we're we got to go through it in detail and really look at how how we're structuring this project um, through those phases um, before we finalize that. But so think of this right now as a as a not to exceed. Uh, we also talked about uh, putting another ten thousand in the extra services line item there. Um, again. Um, if we think that we need an extra 10,000 on top of the 240 there, um, we'll add it in that category. But that was a comment that Mike had made the, as well. The, the one thing, and I mean, we talked a little bit, Lynn, about, about permitting and whether we put some money in there um, and owner's insurance. I mean, we haven't really discussed whether we, um, whether we're looking at builder's risk, are we, are we gonna assign that to the CM? Or you know, would the town take it on? Um, so that's that's one question. I don't know, Tim. Maybe you have some thoughts on that. I have a comment to make on that. We did a pretty thorough analysis on our last project with that, mm -hmm. um, where we looked at having the owner's insurance provider provide quotes as well as getting quotes from from the CM, and it was significantly less. And I think that the only time I usually put money in this owner's insurance uh, line is when it's an ad reno and the owner has to carry builder's sure. risk because they own the building. But because this is a standalone new construction, um, typically we would always put it with the CM or the contractor, the builder's risk insurance. Yeah, insurance admittedly is not my area of expertise. I, mean, I don't, I don't, but that I, you know, I think that's true. They do get, they have better contacts with those insurance markets, but 
you know, one way or the other, it'll, it'll end up being exceeding the cap. So I'm, I think that's a good point, Lynn. I don't think we need it there. So um, I don't think we, we would get it normally anyways. We would give it to the CM. Yeah. So my only question is, is are we building that? Have we built that into our estimates to date? Yeah. I don't know about that. Yeah. I look to. Yeah, I think we do. We do have insurance included in the okay. uh, estimates. If it's included in the estimates, then that's fine. I just want to make sure it's a. I mean, it's not enough money to worry about, but it's yeah, I'm, yeah. The insurance in the estimate is usually not that, but that's fine. I'm fine yeah. with leaving it out. Yeah. So, um, MSBA takes this entire category, uh, even though I mean, they even though it, part of it's the owners use budgets uh, and they use that two two million seven oh six and they apply the cap to that number uh, and part of that is where you get the 946 of ineligible or excluded costs um, and because that's the amount over the cap the 113 692 is the amount of of opm fees assigned to uh, inel ineligible square footage, which I'll show you below when we get to that category. Um, but this, this whole category is new and you can see the calculations for it over on the right and red. Um, well, not on this page, the next page, but overall with both the OPM and the AE um, fees, we're below the cap, the actual 20% soft cost cap of and by three million seven twenty seven five seventy five. Um, and then next is the AEs. This is their basic services, including their uh, consultant fees in this category. And uh, again, the ineligible costs are over here. The two hundred seventy one is related to. Uh, ineligible square footage and the 1,463 is related to the amount of money over the cap, the $500 per square foot cap. So um, one thing to note here in this category, um, I made the suggestion to Lynn that we bump up traffic studies. Um, traffic is certainly a, a sensitive topic on this. So I wanna make sure we have adequate money in there um, to perform additional counts or things like that as needed. Um, so I would, su I suggested to her that we bump that up to 60,000. Again, small dollars, but you know, it's just something that I think we're going to face. Um, and the other thing that's come up recently on, on other jobs is, uh, a post occupancy trap traffic study. Any objections to that? This is another category that because we're already over the cap, you could put that 60,000 almost anywhere so that it could be used yeah, as you yeah. need it. Yep. Yeah. Okay, not, not hearing any objections, so okay, keep going. On. Okay. Um, the next category is uh, construction costs, which I think we've pretty much gone over um, uh, in depth in terms of the construction cost. And this is the cost that we're carrying the 64,525,190. And if you look to the right. Oh, you went on mute. Lynn. Yeah, sorry. If you look to the right, um, you can see that we had um, $2,253 uh, dollars I mean, That's square foot, correct. sorry, in the health and PE category that was ineligible, as well as 169 uh, square feet in the um, dining and food service uh, budget line for um, ineligible square footage. And that plays back up to the two lines in both the OPM and the AE category, which uh, makes uh, our fees associated with that square footage ineligible. So the dining and food, though, that's the stage, correct? Wasn't that the, the yes? The, yeah. So it may it's listed under that because of the quote unquote cafetorium approach to it, but that's really not space that's about the cafeteria. That's space about the stage that is in the cafeteria. Right, and that may that may change when MSBA does their review um, 
but yeah. uh, that was the category that they commented on it in in the PSR. So I just wanted to make it so they could easily match up their comments with the uh, with the thirty eleven. So um, so um, the uh, we also have other caps on the construction, and that's the eight percent um, site cap which is 8% of the construction cost. So as you see here, and you can see over in blue, that we have $7,179,674 of ineligible site costs. And um, to in total, based on the $360 a square foot construction cap, we have a total of um, $21,700,000 thousand nine hundred three dollars in ineligible construction costs plus the markups on that uh, of two million four hundred fifty four thousand seven hundred seventy two so that those two uh, in addition to the the ineligible site cost uh, equals this number you see down here of thirty one million three thirty five three fifty of ineligible costs for construction. Um, before I move on, was there any questions on that? I think it's pretty straightforward. Lynn, I just had a question. Is that pretty typical in a, in a project to have that, that much ineligible? Yes. Well, because, I mean, it's straight, whatever your cost per square foot for construction is. Um, in our case, we have $313.34. That is 100% payable by by the town because that's the difference between our co uh, cost of construction per square foot and MSBA's cap at 360 a square foot. So, so Jeff, if you remember early on, you know, I think we made it pretty clear that we were going to exceed the construction cost cap because it's impossible to build a building for that. Um, and we were going to exceed the site cost cap because inevitably that that happens. Um, you know, there really is no projects that can get down to the absolute minimum and not exceed the caps. Uh, and so we, we just want to make sure that we're not, you know, exceeding them astronomically. Um, and, um, you know, but basically, when we look at our reimbursement rate, you know, I think um, we had said early on that, you know, the effective rate would probably be about 15% lower than the actual um, stated reimbursement rate. And this is sort of in that right around there because um, the effective rate we're looking at with all of this would be around 23%. And our, and our, um, our actual rate is 39. And then that, of course, we add with the incentives as much as we can. So you guys are seeing that pretty much, you know, in the construction jobs you're doing. I just don't want these numbers to appear in the future out of context somewhere. So if you, the, yeah. the more context you guys provide, I think it's great. Yeah, and, yeah. and I think I think it's, a, you know, we're, we're seeing because of people who followed the, you know, even the news know we've seen tremendous escalation in construction in the, this year, 10% even this year. Um, and we have to plan out for some sort of escalation in the future, even though it hopefully it isn't going to be that. So um, we're seeing, you know, numbers that are obvious. The, the MSBA doesn't even make a pretense to say that you can build a building for $360 a square right. foot. So, so they, this is a way for them to make sure, and I think it's a noble and the right way to do it, that they can spread grant money around the state equitably. Um, the big thing I think we should be you know, happy about is the fact that uh, our ineligible space is, is, is pretty, minimal compared to other communities you know we've I, what's the number three thousand square feet or something 3380 yeah looks 3380 like total and you know so that's that's i think a pretty um you know that's a good metric because we're seeing other projects where uh, you know people have more wants around you know bigger gyms even than we have and, and different things that are not eligible so i don't think i've had a project that that's had less than 10,000 square feet of additional square yeah, footage. That's a, that's a, that's a, that's a efficient building. Well, hopefully you do now, Lynn. Yes. Okay. Um, and this, this gets us to the bottom line. Um, 
with all the project costs that we've included here, we're currently at, well, let me go first go, there's a couple of other budget lines we haven't gotten to, and that's the miscellaneous project costs. We've set aside some money for utility company fees and actual utility usage as we might need it. And we've had, we have 100,000 in that category. And we have for testing services for the construction, we have 200,000, but we talked about increasing that to 225,000 in case we had some um, additional pre-construction testing services that might be needed. And uh, we have 150,000 there under other project costs, which um, predominantly is for moving services, moving from one building to the next, but it also can cover any other miscellaneous costs as well. That, cat, that whole category there, um, except for testing services is generally, generally ineligible. Sometimes we can get the utility company fees uh, made eligible. So, so for right now, we definitely know that the, the other project costs, the moving and other expenses is ineligible. So we've counted that as an inel ineligible, but we may see when MSBA comes back to us that some of our utility company fee costs will become ineligible as well. Um, but um, that's where we stand in that category. We're going to try to bump, bump up to testing services a little bit. Um, and then we, we've talked about a few increases, but our intent was is that we weren't going to change the bottom line. We were going to right. take it and reallocate owner's contingency. So you, sh you shouldn't see a change in the bottom line. Um, if anything, we feel very comfortable that what you see here at the as the bottom line is definitely a not to exceed, and we're working on bettering that number. But um, but as I said, we we feel very comfortable that the project will definitely not exceed that number. So one thing, Lynn, um, uh, that we chatted about, um, I think the FF and E number is low. Yes, I hadn't gotten to that yet yeah. either. Yeah, sorry, didn't mean um, to jump ahead on you. But, no, no. Uh, um, MSBA gives us twelve hundred dollars per twelve hundred thousand reimbursed twelve hundred per student. Yeah. Per student. <laughs> Couldn't get the words out. Um, and um, that's typically okay, maybe a little more for technology, but definitely FF and E. We talked right now; it's currently at sixteen hundred per student at the 920, but we talked about increasing that to 1800 per student um, as that's more of an average cost per student. So we will increase, increase that number as well. Um, but it, we do think that technology can definitely be done for the 1600 per student that we sh we've shown here and maybe even less. Um, that so, category is in interchangeable, so you can move money around in that whole FF&E budgeting and technology category. So when I when I discussed this with Lynn earlier, um, I, I feel like the owner's contingency at two percent seems high to me. So you know, in my mind, that increase for FF&E would lower the owner's contingency, not and so again result in a you know, not, not um, increasing the bottom line number. Just reallocating costs. Yeah, right. Um, so again, I mean, without contingencies, we're at 77,376,900 with total exclusions of 34,739,597. Um, and um, with the contingencies, that gets us up to this 81,893,663 that we've been presenting uh, last time and this time. Um, again, we think it's going to be less than that. And we already know that 1 million of that has already been uh, voted on, approved, and uh, appropriated. So we're down to 80,893,633. Um, again, uh, we we think that this the town shares somewhere approximately at 63 million. Um, and then looking at some of the other changes that we're looking at, we're hoping to get that down um, even more. So um, 
that's the full budget in a nutshell. And I think we'll come back to um, come back to this number at the end. It's a, a, I have another slide that may be easier to look at and read. We did a, a quick cost comparison to other districts. Um, and this is probably when we send this, this presentation out to you, it's probably easier for you to take a look at it on your own and kind of digest it. But these are some of our projects and some of Compass's projects and a few other OPM's projects interspersed in there, but um, they're all within the schematic design or construction phase or just beginning to open this fall. So it'll give you a good idea of what other districts are doing. And, yeah, and just and also just sorry to interrupt, but uh, go back to that one. one thing just to keep in mind is that some of these are middle schools, so there's a little bit of a different uh, um, comparison there. Um, they're not all elementary schools, so just bear and, that in and mind. some of them have different time frames, uh, yeah. which I started. There's a couple of lines in here where I started look looking at the time frame of feasibility study and schematic design phase and some of the construction time frames are shorter or longer. Um, so all those affect costs, but this is like a good good tool to look at in terms of comparing yourself to other districts. This and, is and, really and helpful. Yeah, some of these some of these schools, you know, probably uh, got a, got their budget set before the market went crazy too. So there's a lot of factors yeah. that play the differences in these in these yeah. uh, various budgets. I mean, but Hildreth, Hildreth obviously just opened, so it's going to be a very different cost than you know a project that hasn't started construction or won't start construction for another year. Yeah, but it's a good comparison and and something you'll have to to kind of um, take a look at. Um, and then this was just a quick map at all the schools that are happening in and around Medfield um, that are some of know, which are complete, but some are still ongoing. Like um, Millis was completed, you know, Framingham um, was complete. Framingham was completed. Hopkinton, though they're adding on. Um, so, uh, but this gives you a frame of reference of all the schoolwork that's going on. Needham just finished. Sunita um, Williams. Um, Wellesley has um, two projects, one in the MSBA, one outside. Natick's doing their middle school. Ashland, we've talked about. Um, you know, Milford, uh, that's completed as well. Um, but you can just see how, how much school uh, construction is going on around us. Uh, and then this is just a recap of the numbers. Um, a little bit easier to look at. Um, so again, the feasibility study schematic design, the million dollars has already been accounted for. The owner's project manager uh, fee, 2466060 Again, we're working on those. Owner services, uh, there's gonna be a few, uh, um, a little bit of change there, maybe by 10,000. And um, again, any changes we make will come out of owner's contingency. The architecture and engineering fee shown here, we're going to increase the 43,000 shown there for traffic studies up to 60 or, did we say we were gonna do that or are we gonna just leave it and add on later if we need from construction contingent or on owner's contingency? I mean, I, I think we should just make that change and, and but you know, um, yeah. I mean, I, I guess I don't have a preference since yeah. you know it doesn't matter either way since we've hit our cap. So yeah, I don't know if anybody has a strong opinion about it, but it doesn't sound like it. Okay. <laughs> I, hear, it I hear crickets. What was that, Mike? I don't think it matters. Okay. Yeah. Um, the pre-construction services, we've sat at $225,000. we are hoping that we have a short pre-construction timeframe. Um, and then construction costs at the $64,535,190. The miscellaneous costs that we talked about, we were going to increase the testing services allowance a little bit for any pre-construction services that we might need by $25,000. So instead of $450,000, it'd be $475,000. 
we're going to increase in the next category, the FFNE, the 1,840 is going to go up uh, by $200 per student. And I don't know exactly what that amount is off the top of my head. But again, that'll come out of owner's contingencies. The owner contingency at 2% is 1,290,504. And the construction contingency at 5% is 3,226,260. We talked about both of these. Um, we talked about uh, construction contingency going from 5% to 4%, but we decided based on the volatility of the market that we would, it would probably be better for us to leave it where it is. And, you know, if we don't spend it, it, it doesn't get spent, but um, we don't know what's going to happen with, with when it comes to bidding. Um, we can do as much due diligence yeah. as we can in terms of cost, but we haven't been able to it, to control what's happening in the market. So, yeah, my my initial reaction was that you know five percent was on the high side, but after what I've seen over the last few months um, from the construction market, I feel there's too much risk in there and lowering that number at this point because um, you know unfortunately in in Ashland where we uh, set the budget and voted on the project in January before this big price spike. Um, we've since seen all the prices spike and we've had to cut and cut and cut out of the building um, to the point where they've, ha they've had to make some painful and still are making painful decisions um, about programs um, that may get that may get cut out of the, the project. And um, I don't want to see us being penny wise and pound foolish um, to me, which is, you know, say, you know, the difference of half a million or a million bucks is, in my mind, um, not the right move at this stage, given where the market is. But that's, uh, again, just one person's opinion. When you V something after a bid, you don't get dollar for dollar the value of it. So uh, it's better to have the money tucked where you can pull it out and decide whether or not you want to use it or not. Yeah. We talked about taking the owner's contingency from 2% to 1%. And I think some of these moves that we've made may, may get us close to that as well. Um, but the bottom line is that um, we're looking to um, be within the budget that we presented uh, on August 18th and currently our not to exceed vote request is for 80,893,663. Again, we're hoping to reduce that um, as, we, as we hone in on the budget a little bit more. Um, and hopefully by the next, well, I would say we have to, by the next um, school building committee meeting, have all the numbers um, firmed up. And so that also puts us between somewhere between 18 and a half and 19 million of, of grant from the MSBA. Um, so I think given where we stand, you know, I, I think the team's done a good job trying to maximize that number. And obviously, you know, as, as Tim noted, um, just keeping the ineligible square footage as low as possible. I think uh, this, you know, this does that. Um, so we're not asking for things that, we don't necessarily really need. So like the bond issue would be 60, about 62 million. So a million less than that bottom line number there. Uh, so um, we need to bond the project and then the MSBA would reimburse us. Right. Um, so we would have to bond the, the entire amount. Um, and you know we could talk about the, the the town will talk about their structure for how they do that because the timing of everything. I talked a little bit with uh, the treasurer the other day, but um, so we would need to bond the whole amount, but the MSBA would reimburse us. And if 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 we, as this noted, if we get the full use of the eligible contingencies and we spend every dollar exactly to the dollar, the end result would be sixty two million nine sixty four that the town would pay for. But a million of which we've already bonded, appropriated. Correct. So it's, the, the, yes. that's correct, right, Mike? I mean, we correct. would reduce so, the appropriation request by a million dollars. Correct. So the appropriation request is at the bottom, right? 80.893. Yeah. Right. Right. Okay. okay. Our, our total... The town share is not a straight one to one million dollars because of the way the formulas work, right. Uh, right. but it, it does bring it down significantly. Um, it probably won't bring it down the full 1 million um, and because 
just the way the MSBA formulas work, but it will bring it will bring that number down closer but, to sixty two million. But I think uh, I think and maybe I just want to make sure I'm understanding what what um, Bob is asking. But when we go to town meeting in November, the uh, warrant will be written with that bottom number of eighty point eight nine three six six three. So, Mike, just for clarification, um, we're bonding the whole amount and MSBA is reimbursing us or we're borrowing the town share and then MSBA will provide us milestone money along the way. Uh, so I, I believe we're bonding the full amount. Okay. Well, typically we appropriate the full amount. Yeah, no, no, I'm we, sorry, we, would, we would only bond the only town the town yes, share. Sorry, I, 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 okay. I apologize. Yeah, uh, that's correct. Um, appropriate okay. that full amount. And then, we'll you know, the town share amount. Okay. Yeah. And again, so, and I, you know, I know we discussed it a little bit, but the timing and, and, and all of that of when we go to bond, when we go to market with the bond, um, you know, we have some flexibility there, but um, given where the bond market is, hopefully that's favorable. Some towns bond all at once, some do it over, you know, based on cash flow and, and where they expect interest rates to right. be. So, um, you know, that's all a whole nother side of it. But um, in terms of the amount, yes, the, uh, the bond amount would be around 63 million. Okay, thank you. And that's all the slides I have. I don't know if anybody has any questions on one in particular or or Lynn, can you go can you go back to the slide with all the other towns do you mind and all the other schools the map or the cost <clears throat> it was no the cost i don't care about the map <laughs> so is there a um reimbursable like is there a um is there a column here that tells us how much the state's reimbursing all these other towns as well or is that not public knowledge? It's not no, on here. There, but, but I could I could add that probably. Yeah, it's, that's going to vary pretty widely. Um, yeah, no, I'm just I'm just you know the construction costs for the most recent jobs are very similar to you know to what we're looking at. You know when you kind of do per student. Yeah, I mean the the cost per student is 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 a, a an easier way to you know look at comp comparison. Um, you know, but you, we obviously we always have to factor in the time value of money. So, you know, comparing a school from that's not in construction versus one that's been completed um, is going to be a big difference. But I've been com doing close comparisons with because they're mostly because they're in our office is is Ashland, um, which um, unfortunately has the wrong design enrollment here, Lynn. Uh, no big deal. But um, the actual that's design funny. enrollment is 635. So 60 more kids than us, they're a year ahead of us um, and um, a slightly larger building. And they're at about 84 million total, um, 67 million construction. Um, and then the other close comparison is Westwood. Uh, Westwood has 560 compared to our 575. Um, and they've got an $87 million project um, and about, um, uh, I think 70, uh, 70 million in construction. Um, so I believe uh, I, I was talking to uh, my colleague about that one the other day, the town share in Westwood will be around 69, uh, 69 million for a similarly sized school. Um, and uh, as opposed to 63, which is what we're looking at. So um, similar communities, similar size projects, you know, those are those are a couple of ones that I use as a guide to sort of figure out where I think we should fall personally. Um, but that just gives you a frame of reference. Any other questions from the not sure, but Leo just got into the audience. Oh, thank you, Tim, for monitoring that. Let me bump him up. Mike, this is Mike Marcucci, just following up on what you mentioned about Ashland and, and somewhat similar to what I was talking about the last time. I mean, where do we turn to next in the building um, if we have this escalation or if we have to cut back further? What is the ne next thing we do if we have fewer than 10,000 square feet 
above what the MSBA requires. So presumably we can't go below it and stay in the program. So where do we go next? Like, what is the thing? I mean, I don't know if you can put up a map of the building or put up a list of the rooms or what it's covering. I know in the draft schematic design, there's a page in there that's got kind of the different uses, but in the square foot and the minimums and all that, and I, I can pull out that page somewhere, but that's what I'm curious about. If, if we had to shrink it because of inflation or for any other reasons, what, what goes, what would go next? So it wouldn't be program, right? Cause that would, that would have a much bigger um, snowball <laughs> effect. So, and if you remember Mike back um, in the, uh, I think it was May or June when we first got the uh, estimates for schematic design, we went through, I mean, it's technically not value engineering, but we went through a, a, a cost reduction exercise where we looked at the cost estimates and um, the team presented, you know, a, a, about $3 million worth of items to get the budget back to uh, where we felt it should be. Um, so we still have some items that we didn't take from that list. Um, and those are items that don't necessarily, not all of them, but some of them don't necessarily impact program. Um, there are things that would impact program, um, you know, things like, you know, if we cut the outdoor classrooms or if we cut, um, you know, reduce the, um, you know, the playground, things that aren't necessarily education based, but that um, would be part of the program that we would potentially cut. Um, but those are in the you know, tens to hundreds of thousand dollars of, of cuts. Um, anything beyond that, if we're getting up into the millions of dollars of, of cuts that would be needed, um, that's that's a significant problem um, because that would mean cutting cutting program. And um, as you can see, with that only three thousand and change of extra square footage, um, there's not a lot here that's in this project that um, isn't. Um, uh, that is above the minimum. Uh, it's it's pretty much down to the bare bones. Um, I think no, you would hit categories like the the extra field. You might take that away, or you might have to make some hard decisions on geo. You know your your geothermal or. Yeah, I mean the only thing those would be like if we took the field away. That that would be a million and change. Um, if we looked at the, the geothermal and, and the net zero goal and went to more of a, a standard um, system, but there's, there's snowball effects with that even in terms of um, you know, incentives that, that, we, that we're geared up for receiving down the line. Um, so I think we'd wanna be careful there. Um, but to, in, in my mind, um, you know, this is a pretty conservative budget for the type of project it is. Um, it's not something that's extra liberal, liberal. There's not, a, there's not, in my mind, there's no fluff in here that can just easily be taken out and is, is, um, something that nobody will miss. When you is say, cut, when you, not, not entirely. No. I mean, when you say cut program, what do you mean by that? I mean, does it mean what, what I'm trying to understand is I, I, as I understand it, the classrooms are essentially the size they have to be. Correct. According to the... To meet the MSBA minimums, yep. MSBA minimum, the, the school's department's class size guidance and the, the various rules around that. So the classrooms are kind of fixed. We've got to have, is it 26 classrooms? Uh, off the top of my head. Um, right, 13 per... It's 37 total, I believe. 37 total. 37. Oh, yeah. Um, so, right. So, the, but those are, but, but, see, so if you start with the 37 classrooms, which I guess I'm struggling with the math here, but um, those are fixed. You can't change those. In other words, we have to have those to be in the MSBA program and- To meet, to meet the, the class size requirements. Yeah, I, mean, with, uh, I think the MSBA number is 23, correct me if I'm wrong. Lynn, do you know that number, was... remember that number? Or Tina? Yeah, um, well, we have a total of 26 and um, with the 575, I think it was supposed to be actually um, 25 classrooms. 
And so we opted to make it an even number or equal number for fourth grade and fifth grade. So it's a total of right, we have, classrooms. You could have change people. that after schematic design without MSBA requiring you to go back and redo right. your schematic design. Right. And that, that's what I'm trying to, to get at. Here. So the, the, the classrooms are fixed, right? We that's basically have to have 26 classrooms and they have to be the size they are on there. And Correct. so what I'm wondering, again, because as I understand it, if this is approved at town meeting, we can't exceed that appropriation. So if there's continued escalation and inflation and we have to cut more than the playground and the field and the outdoor classrooms. Um, that's what contingency is for uh, as well. Yeah. Like, and, and that's why, you know, I, I don't I, I, I would I'd be hesitant to use too much of it before we actually started putting shovels in the ground. But the reason why um, I would recommend not going to the 4%, which was my initial reaction on the construction contingency is, is largely due to where the market volatility has been. Um, and I think it's, it's short-sighted to cut maybe, you know, six or $800,000 out of the construction contingency when we might see this trend of um, construction prices uh, continue to rise um, because once we fix our budget in November, if it's approved, um, you know, the goal here is not to go back to the town and say, well, construction prices went up, we need another million. So um, I'd, I'd much rather be conservative on the contingency side here and uh, be able to deal with some of those price spikes without having to go back to the town. No, I, I get it. And that's why I'm trying to back into this question of, again, if, if it's covered by the contingency, um, and, and assuming the next thing we would cut but after using the contingency would be these kind of value engineering items. Correct. But if we had to make, you know, a $10 million cut in the budget, we're talking about cutting what, like what would we be eliminating? Well, I, that's the thing is I don't think that there is a possibility for the, for that type of cut, a $10 million cut. Um, that would mean, you know, we would be cutting significant programming. Um, and what do know, you mean by programming, Mike? Meaning the um, the educational program, like right, right. So all of this is based on the educational program. So you know, a ten million dollar cut would mean cutting, you know, cut square eight, footage eight classrooms. Like that may that may mean a building that doesn't even meet our current needs um, to get down that significant of a cut. Our current enrollment, um, you know, or that means like you know we've got 35 kids in a classroom as opposed to, you know, 23. Well, but I'm um, assuming that you have to have 26 classrooms, right? That's, that's, right. we've got to have that. So we're not cutting classrooms that's fixed and, and done. Mm -hmm. um, and so when you say, so what are the programs we're cutting if we had to make a cut of that size, either because of inflation or for other reasons? I mean, I think and, you look at Jeff or you, Steve can speak to this. I mean, you well. look at the breakout <laughs> rooms and the areas that we put in there, we put breakout rooms throughout, uh, meeting spaces. I think you'd probably have to start reducing that. We have out, outside uh, breakout rooms, outside the classrooms for project-based learning, which is a big part of what our educational plan was. I think you take that out. Um, learning stair, you take that out. I mean, all those things that we put in there that I think really going to make the school special and, and that focus in our, in our education plan, I think you just start taking those out, I, I guess. So, I mean, but we, we got to be careful here about, you know, doing that has implications with the MSBA. Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, it's not just that we can say, hey, we've, we've, we've got a budget bust and we need to cut 10 million. No, I'm just trying to get Mike where the 10 yeah, million yeah. program would be. Yeah, I know no. that's, that's a lot of implications there. Yeah, I just want to make sure that's clear. And because and, we can't just go back to the MSBA and say we cut all these program spaces because right. they're going to they're going to have an issue with that because we've, you know, and, and they're going to relook at their grant and, and, and really question it. If it came in that high over budget, I think you would have to reject all bids, rethink your schedule, and maybe even consider uh, holding off and doing it at a different time, bid, rebidding at a different time, or changing your construction delivery method. Those are the types of things you might look at to try to reduce costs. Yeah, mm -hmm. certainly the, the construction delivery method would be on the table, right, to go back to a hard bid number. Um, that would be something, but I, I still, uh, 10, 10 million is a, is a large number. Yeah. Um, and I just, well, and I, since I we're only, old, it, we get there. it seems like since we're only 10, less, fewer, less than 10,000 square feet over the MSBA, 
number, we probably can't cut more than that and stay in the MSBA program. That seems to me to be, if they have minimums, they're, are, they're not going to improve. I mean, would they ever approve somebody that was below their minimums? And that they, they have minimums for a reason, but. I'm, I'm unaware of that, but I don't know, Lynn or Tim, if you have any experience with that. I mean, I think that, um, I got what you're getting at, Mike, but, you know, we're dealing with this on every project right now, trying to predict inflation and trying to predict this volatile market. And, you know, in Ashland, as Mike knows, we put those numbers in before the, the most recent burst of, I mean, the town approved it before the most recent, um, which have been unprecedented, not, not since probably 2004 was when we had these sort of crazy numbers occurring in the marketplace that you could, you know, vendors wouldn't hold prices and all that. And so, you know, even there, when we dealt with the, when we had the budget come in, what was that over, Mike? That was over six or 7% or 8%, something like that. Uh, the, the first one was 5 million. So that was like yeah. 7% or 8%. You know, we found, you find other ways to, to find that, those kinds of numbers. So I would hope we're not going to deal with another, but we've already incorporated that burst of craziness into the numbers. Yeah. And so I would hope we're not going to deal with, and maybe Walt, you know, you, you get a lot of information through Gil Bain. I, I, I don't think that we um, are thinking, you know, this was a sort of a reflex from the pandemic, from a whole bunch of different things that occurred this last one. And so I think, I just don't think we're going to see that. I mean, I hope not. I mean, I don't know if it's sustainable. And I think Lynn said the right thing. I mean, you know, if it was that ridiculous, then we would probably have to decide whether we move forward. I mean, that means we're in an abnormal even than what it has been abnormal environment. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, we don't have some option to use cheaper materials or some sort of, um, you know, something like that that would. I, you know, I, I guarantee problem. you that there's enough, and, and I, I'm, I'm based on my experience, there's enough uh, in that building that if we had to go back in and pull some stuff out, we'd find ways to pull it out to get the normal value engineering that you normally deal with in these projects and it's there you know but but that i don't know what it is but it's 10 there. million is not the number there though yeah 10 million is not normal but I'm it's just probably five percent is you know what you get out before you start yeah. affecting program right. maybe six or seven but after probably seven percent you're starting to affect program yeah so that's the number jim five percent ish just finishes that sort of stuff hey leo can you mute It's it's probably. I, can, good. I was going to say, like, can we put it? I think on this project, that number is less like than five percent. Uh, I'm just trying to clarify Mike's question just a little bit more because I, I I like where he's going. Um, and Jim, you brought up a point. You said five to seven percent. Like, you know, I go through a value engineering process on eighty five percent of our projects, right? Where it's finishes, yep. rework of ceilings, you know, that type of stuff that doesn't really change programming. I just don't know what that percentage is overall to a project like this. Yeah. So is it like three to 5% is something that we can probably hold the program, you know, maybe, you know what I mean? And, you know, obviously we're giving things up when we do that, but I'm just I curious. think so. I mean, Walt and I just went through the, you know, some of the difficulties that, you know, Mike and Tim and Lynn are talking about. We just went through at a project in Brookline that was a $96 million construction project had 6 million of overrun and in six weeks, we were able to take out that 6 million and it was looking at um, the envelope and, you know, the usual, you know, looking at storefront uh, versus curtain wall, looking at the building systems, you know, everything we could do to um, value engineer the building, still keep quality. And as, you know, Mike said a few times, not affect program. And that's the challenge. Yeah, but your, um, your big takeout was, Geothermal, right? Uh, that was actually yeah. below the line. It was already uh, out. But there were... Yeah, that was below the line. So, oh, um, so and, we, and, we, and we went into contingency a little bit. So yeah, we rebid and we went into contingency a little bit. So, but just so we're, yeah. as a frame of reference, Jim, you took out six million out of a total construction budget 96. of of ninety six. Right. So as opposed to so we have a, a sixty four million dollar budget. Right. Construction. But back um, to Mike's question that I was trying to, you know, uh, talk about it, that's at the five to 6% range. Right? Yeah. 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 Thank you. Yep. Yep. 
But to Lynn's point, this the school in Brookline had more to take out of it than ours. Yeah, it, it was a, it was a higher higher end like design a, building, so there was yeah, more than five five too. A, yep. It's a cap number, I would say, for Wheelock for sure. For the new right. elementary. That, that's helpful. Um, thank you. Mike, uh, any follow-ups? Mike Marcucci, I want to make sure we address your question as completely as we can. I know yeah, no, I, 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 I think I'm getting there. So it seems like we have the contingency and then we have maybe on top of the contingency another, let's call it 5% that you could squeeze out of this and still deliver what the building is supposed to deliver from an educational standpoint, according to how you know the, the school the school wants to run itself and what it wants to do, right? I mean, I think yeah, there's other ways to get there if if that's your your frame of reference from a number perspective. But that's why you know when I when I hear ten million, and I I know you're just kind of randomly picking a number, um, you know that that just goes beyond our capability to do that. Um, so, but I think J Jim gave you you know a fairly reasonable. Um, sort of maximum that we would expect to do before we really start to cut bone and 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 the key here right guys too is we're going to be working with the cm during this process that's the key part of the 149a you know uh, pre-construction process is rather than the waiting till the end putting our toes in the water in the bid process and saying how do we do we're going to be totally testing the market along the way doing a you know a, a battery of estimates and um, you know, continue to check. And if we have to make nips and tucks, we do it before we get out to bid, and before there's a real issue. So I think you know this this pre-construction process is really key to maintaining where we are now. And and you know, obviously, you know, between left field, Arrow Street, um, myself and Tim from Compass, you know, Mike from Gaston, Walt from Gilbane. Um, even if it's not this project, we're always in touch with where the market's going. Um, so we'll just have to monitor that and, and hope that it stabilizes uh, come next year because we, we do have a year to go before, or pretty much not maybe less than a year at this point, but uh, before we start bidding an early trade package. Yeah, I, I would echo Jim's point on the 149A, having a GC on board early to really help to, you know hone this in <clears throat> throughout the process, pick up all the holes in the drawings that are going to be there. Um, Sorry, Arrow Street. I know you're not going to have any of <laughs> <laughs> You know, all that type of stuff that we always deal with on projects that cost us more money than what right. the original project is. You know, we can really flush that stuff out. So although it may be, you know, a percent or two more like on surface, the reality is they may save us that money too. So just to follow up a little bit on what Dr. Marsden was talking about, was that was the are those breakout rooms and meeting rooms and whatnot, is that included in the square footage that is over and above the MSBA minimums? I know a chunk of that, um, that 10,000 or so that's over and above the minimums is the gym, which enables us to have two full courts, which I think is a great value for the town as anyone who's tried to find a basketball court um, between October and April and Medfield can attest and we'll get great use out of that and probably generate revenue out of that. But um, so I know that's about 3000 over, but are, are those breakout rooms and meeting space? And is that sort of, is that part of that amount that's over and above the MSBA minimum? No. Okay. That's part of the MSBA minimum. Yes. For that, based off of our educational program, those spaces are sized to the MSBA minimum. Yes. So to take those out, we'd have to take out the programmatic pieces they're supporting. Yeah, that basically, it wouldn't align with our ed program. And that's when the MSBA, once we get out of alignment with our educational program, you know, they're gonna, they're gonna red flag that. And we're gonna have to talk about it because, you know, we put all, they base, they base so much on, on the educational program um, and meeting that. And that's, that's how that whole space summary was developed based off of our educational program. So when we're taking out spaces that are directly tied to that, that'll be a red flag for them. Okay. And in, incidentally, like, you know, sometimes there's things like just cutting one or two classrooms that you're not really saving, you know, when you, when you factor in 
you know, the inefficiencies of, of having to, you know, rework the building and, and not always, um, you know, a simple say, just multiply the square footage times the, the cost per square foot. Like there's, cause some certain systems are sized that, you know, cutting square footage won't necessarily decrease the size of a system or something like that. So um, it can get pretty complicated, but um, not to belabor the topic. Gotcha. Anyone else have thoughts or questions? No, oh, I'm surprised. Um, so there are a couple of questions in the chat from the public. So, um, you know, I think now would be a good time to address those. So uh, first up, uh, Tom Powers asks, can you direct taxpayers to comparable towns of about 13,000 Wikipedia population paying 41 million per grade for an elementary school? I checked the MSBA figures today and couldn't find any. I'm not asking square foot cost or any other cost, just cost per grade. So um, I've, I, I know you've asked this question before, uh, Mr. Powers, I, you may you may not um, like the answer, but cost per grade is is not a data point that makes it easy to compare towns, especially for Medfield. Medfield um, is very much unlike other towns because all of our kids go through every grade and every school together. Um, so we have three elementary schools, and every kid goes to every elementary school. So um, the majority of towns in Massachusetts use a neighborhood school program. So they may have, let's say a similarly sized town has three elementary schools. They have three elementary schools where they're all K to five. So um, there are three districts and each district goes to that school. So then, are there, then there are six grades. So if Medfield were to have that kind of program with our three elementary schools, replacing one elementary school with another elementary school is no different from K to five to a two grade school in the overall population. Um, you end up with six grades versus two grades, but it's the same number of kids. So, you know, taking the cost of the project and divide it just by the grades is not an effective uh, comparison for uh, other schools that are K to five because they have six grades. Um, what is a good comparison is the cost per student. Um, that's something that you, we can look at. Obviously, not it's not apples to apples across all towns um, because of different sites. Sometimes there's different things that impact projects. Um, but in terms of comparing similarly um, sized towns and similarly sized projects, um, a cost per student would be a more uh, appropriate comparison. But Mike, I mean, couldn't couldn't you back into that number? I mean, if you took you know, if you took a school that's building an elementary school and they have five elementary schools in town, you can multiply that cost times five and then divide by the number of grades, right? You kind of get there. I mean, just for Wellesley, yeah, I, mean, I, I, I think I Wellesley has could, neighborhood yeah. schools, right? You can take the Wellesley number and if they have four schools, multiply the Wellesley number times four and then divide by the grades to get what they're paying per grade for the town. Now, obviously, you can't compare. But Wellesley can't, isn't replacing all those schools. No, I, I know. But I mean, if you were trying to figure out what it was, you'd have to hypothesize that they were, right? Because yeah, well, the, right. the, 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 the issue all is, is well, that no, no, nobody's actually no, doing it. I'm just saying if you were trying actually, to get, get to is, it. The issue hold, hold is on, actually, one time, please. The issue is, is if you are actually going to compare the actual socioeconomic um, of, of the town, the most condensed areas are going to have a higher population in those K-5 schools than the, in those neighborhood schools. So my, I'll take, you know, I'll take Sharon because everyone knows I worked in Sharon, so I'm most familiar with it. But the Heights Elementary School is the highest uh, population in Sharon. And so therefore, that school is a higher population of number of students. So no, you can't actually do an apples to apples. And in, in here in Medfield, we have we've condensed everything into a grade level. So therefore it's better for a student to student ratio. 
No, no, I, I, I get, I get it, Leo. I'm not saying that it's, it's the best comparison. I'm just saying you could, you could figure it out. I'm not sure it would tell you anything useful, but you could figure it out. I mean, it's, it's, it's I don't know that I don't not know doing it the exact same. I don't know that it tells you anything useful either, but you could back into that number. I think what skews it is that this school only has two grades, but they still have to provide a gym, a cafeteria, um, all these spaces that schools that may have three or four grades per school, they provide they provide those same spaces for four or five grades versus us providing the same spaces for only two grades. Right. I mean, and this is the only, Medville is the only school that I know of that's just two grades. Yeah, no, there's no, there's no question. There's an inefficiency by having three schools across the setup. Right, probably operational. Yeah, I mean, I guess, I guess what I'm getting at, Mike, if, if, if I sort of reverse your logic for a second, if we assumed our three elementary schools were all K to five, and redistributed even evenly, right across that, um, so that you don't have any population swings, the 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 cost to replace one of those schools is the same. Now we're dividing it by five, by six grades um, for the same population. Do you see what I'm getting at? That's why, you know, to me, the, the best the best way to compare would be to look at a cost per student because if we're looking at a cost per student from Medfield, um, and we look at you know say Westwood, which is a K to five but has 560 kids, and we look at their cost per student, um, you know, to me that's at least close enough relevancy to uh, do a good comparison to see where those two uh, are similar or different. No, I, I agree with you that it's a better comparison. I'm just saying that that you could make some assumptions and come up with the number. I suspect it would would tell you the same thing the cost per student tells you. It, you know, it might tell you that we would be better off with two rather than three schools overall. But but you know, we're not in a position to do that for, net, for the next right. fifteen or twenty years. Should we go back to a three um, three grade model here? Is that what you want? Can talk about that again. It would be more efficient. <laughs> we tried. I'll second that motion. <laughs> no kidding. Okay. Uh, next up, uh, Chris McHugh Potts. Uh, the cost comparison chart would include cost per square foot. Am I missing a line? Uh, no, I don't think we've done that analysis yet. And, and quite honestly, there's some square footages there that are, I know with Ashland at least, that are inaccurate. So. Uh, that chart will need to be updated, um, but there is not a line in that chat chart currently on cost per square foot. Uh, next question from Chris, is 900 square feet truly the minimum classroom size per MSBA? The statutes seem to allow for less. Um, and um, uh, th uh, the um, by statute, um, Can I answer that? Yeah, go ahead, Emily. I, I, was yeah, just re sorry. I was just reading your text. <laughs> I was trying you can to answer, make it easier. My apologies. Yeah, if you look at 963 CMR 2.06, item seven, table four, uh, it states space al allowance by program activity. So the approved design and educational program and project scope and budget agreement shall be within the limitations at set as set forth in the following table. Uh, and we are in elementary school. So if you look at the line for elementary school core classrooms for grades one through eight, the minimum is 900 net square feet. The maximum is 1000 net square feet. And just to follow this through, net square feet is measured from inside wall to inside wall. In my experience, the MSBA will not allow the project to continue until you meet that minimum threshold with the net square feet. And that's after SD, after DD, when you start to work through all of the systems that go through that. So it, it is a very clear statue. Yeah, we, we, we already had to have a call with them to talk about cubbies inside the room and outside the room and what that qualifies for in terms of square footage. Um, so they were pretty adamant on that one. All right. Um, also from Chris McHugh per Mike Marcucci's comments, concerns about MSBA not following through with its grant if project elements are cut, public records show it's never happened. MSBA bends over backwards to work with districts. Um, I'm not gonna speculate about what the MSBA would or wouldn't do. 
um, what I what I have said is that um, if we are cutting educational program out of this, um, they will reevaluate. That that will be a red flag, and they will reevaluate their grant. Um, I, will, I have. We will have to redo this process again to if we're going to change the right. schematic design. Right. So I I have never been part of a project where they we have gone below minimums or where. Um, you know, we haven't met the educational program that's been agreed to. So um, that would be up to the MSBA and I certainly won't speak to them. I was involved in a project where we just flipped the building um, and MSBA made us resubmit our schematic design. So it has happened, not never happened, right? Yeah. Okay. Yes, and I've been on the receiving end of that as well. And it cost 20 million extra dollars for taxpayers. That's it. it. It has happened and it does happen. All right, uh, last question I have uh, uh, also from Chris McHugh. Please clarify answer to Mike Marcucci's question. In MSBA's professional response to Medfield, MSBA clearly noted that the breakout spaces exceed allowed reimbursable square footage are the breakout spaces considered reimbursable by MSBA or are they not based on allowed square footage? MSBA has stated that those spaces exceeded the allowed amount. Also, it was noted in Medfield's response to the MSBA that staffing would be such to allow for adequate supervision of the breakout spaces. What is the increase in staff cost to do so? Um, the, the increase in staffing is shown in the budget statement that was included in the PSR and um, MSBA, the only ineligible space that MSBA has given us are the ones that we just showed you earlier on the um, project budget template. Thanks, Lynn. All right, so um, any other questions on the budget? Otherwise, I think, um, you know, we, we should um, move to finalize this um, based on the adjustments we've discussed here tonight, but overall the bottom line number wouldn't change. Um, any discussion on that or would anyone like to make a motion on that? We're asking basically to submit um, the budget that we've shown here as a not to exceed budget in the schematic design documents and to submit the schematic design submission to MSBA on September 8th. You wanna do that as, those as separate or as one vote, Lynn? I think it, could, I think it all we need to do is um, vote to submit the schematic design submission so, yeah, so if, if we're voting on the SD submission, is there anything else that anyone had any comments on on the SD submission before we take a vote on it? We talked about the budget, obviously, but um, I know we had some comments at our last meeting. Um, Want to make sure everybody's questions have been addressed. Yeah, I think we wouldn't vote the, the project budget until we have a final, a final one, just, you know, with all the revisions made. Sure. So that could be voted on later. Okay. So any questions, I guess, going back to the SD submission, any questions, comments, or concerns about um, approving um, left field to submit that to the MSBA? So this is just on the schematic design, not the actual final budget. So it would be a not to exceed budget. So any final budget would be less if at, at, or, or equal to. We, we would ask you to vote on that later once we've made all the revisions that are Let's needed. Just, yeah. Or we would cover those costs ourselves, right? I mean, if we decided to add a field or something else, that would be completely on us without the actual in, including in the project. So if it's a field, regardless, it's going to be entirely on us at this point. But um, yeah, no, um, I'm just saying, like, unless you're something else included in the project, yeah. Yeah, unless you know you're throwing a monkey wrench in it, that could get pretty complicated. Adding something. No monkey wrenches. No, I'm just saying. Well, I mean, anything else that we decide to add to the project, whether it's a 
drive up wireless uh, charging spaces. Yeah, so things like that, um, when we get into the next phase of design, um, would come out of, um, you know, we have design contingencies that's part of the, the project, and then we have construction and owners contingencies. So if we added something after that, it would have to come out of those contingencies. Um, it wouldn't be increasing the budget, right? Because we're setting so a budget. Safe, exactly. So a safe way to state this is that we're voting the reimbursable budget. We're, we're voting a, right now a, a not to exceed budget that is, is in, a, in essence, um, the maximum number that we will ask the town for in November. Does that make sense? Yep, absolutely. Just make, make a charm, just uh, clear on the yeah, number. No, I have no, no problem with the question, Leo. Uh, so moved. Uh, I don't think there was a, a motion on the <laughs> Sorry. Table, so. <laughs> put, put it out there, Mike. Put it out there. So I'll, I'll, I'll say um, I will entertain a motion to authorize um, left field to submit the schematic design submission um, as noted in the uh, final draft uh, that was distributed earlier this week um, with the uh, revisions to the budget that we discussed this evening. So I, I, I have a, just a couple of, I apologize. I, I, this is a 1400 page thing that I printed it's out okay. here. So I'm trying to get to my, my, my uh, tags here. So just, just looking back. Yeah. Just, just looking back at the, at this, submission it's on page 26 of the um schematic design report it's the breakdown the, the chart that compares the msba guidelines um to the psr pdp sd and then it precedes the space summary narrative and all that and then because i was looking at it and this is just following up on my earlier questions and so let me know when you're there on, on page. I hope it's the right page 26 because the way this is divided up, there's probably eight different page 26s of the different yeah, yeah. these and the portions of the, but I think it's of the main schematic design report. It's Emily or one. Tina, is that something you could pull up? Yep, I'm actually pulling it up right now. Sorry, it is a large file. So it yeah, no, it was big. Time. And, and, <laughs> and I'm, I'm still a you know, Luddite who likes to have stuff printed out in paper. To read. Um, Sorry, it's still opening up. Okay, um, and, and maybe you can answer this without the chart as you pull it up. But one of the yep. things it, ha it has in there, it has the total net area and the total gross area, and there's a delta of about thirty-three thousand mm -hmm. square feet. And so, what's yep. in that? What's in the the difference between the gross and the net? What's what's reflected there? Yeah, I, I can help answer that. Yep. So the net, as Emily had um, explained earlier, are your room spaces. Those are interior room spaces. So those are from the interior wall to interior wall. So that doesn't include wall thicknesses. So you obviously you have the construction of walls between spaces, but also the exterior wall um, has a certain thickness. Um, so it doesn't include those areas. So those are all part of gross. But in addition to growth, there are also a number of other spaces, such as storage rooms, um, mechanical rooms, um, staircases. So those are all part of circulation, um, hallways. Um, there might be some additional um, toilet, toilet rooms. Um, I mentioned closets and storage, uh, instrument storage room. Um, we also have a mother's room. So that's all part of gross, the gross area. And then I'm going to go one step further. So the mother's room is required because you have more than 50 employees. That's um, according to the American Care Act. Um, and you're going to see kind of an interesting um, net to gross factor. Uh, so the MSBA does not allow you to go over 1.5, right? Uh, so, so they don't want um, any tricks where you you'll put in weight a lot of gross square footage. Mm -hmm. Um, to the net. So just watch that ratio. We watch that ratio as architects. Um, and at each stage going forward after SD, we'll actually have to report where our gross square footage is based on other occupied rooms. So like the mother's room that Nina, uh, the, that Tina had um, 
suggested we have to break it out for MEP, FP, so mechanical, electrical, plumbing, fire protection, closet, supply room, storage rooms, toilet rooms, circulation, and then remaining. And, and a good chunk of that is the wall thicknesses. Mm -hmm. I got it. Right. So, so that basically the gross is the total footprint of the building times the store times how many levels you have in the net is what people are going to be in most of the time, essentially. Got it. And then looking back at, um, if you look earlier in the same um, part piece of the submission, there's a map um, or a floor layout, or I don't know, I apologize for not using the architecturally correct term, but basically the layout, it's the color coded layout by usage um, in, in what the spaces are being used for. Mm -hmm. Let me know when you're there. In, in this Do you have a page about where, number? Like the so classrooms, this is, the classrooms yeah, it, are blue. Yep. Yeah, it looks like and the that. cafeteria is orange. Yes, yep. mm -hmm. it doesn't actually have a. I don't see a page number on it actually. Page twenty one. Oh, okay. Twenty one, but thirty two of the PDF that you sent out. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. There we go. So, so just when we were talking earlier about breakout rooms and some of that extra space, I mean. The, the purple spaces on here, that's all special education, right? That's special education space and yep. related to that. And so presumably that's that's space we, we need. Um, where are on here those breakout rooms and meeting rooms that you were talking about, Dr. Marsden or Steve Granham, whoever wants to speak to it, kind of what we're talking about? Because I, I had a little trouble finding them on the map. Yeah, I can help answer. Um, so those breakout spaces are within the classroom pods. Uh -huh. um, I don't know so, if you can visually see it on your printout. So where it calls um, like a project area, is that what we're talking about? Yep, the project area, and then there's also private breakout. So oh, private oh, breakout is there we go. within a closed door room. Um, so the one on one needs to happen, that can happen. Tina, are you able to share? Um... It's um, I can page. try sharing screen. Let's yeah, see what I have. Yeah, looks like a lot of folks the, can understand Mike's questions. Yeah, I mean, it, it looks like in an, an earlier era, you might say that the you know, the project areas are part of the hallway, and the breakout space is a closet. At least it looks like on there. But that's what it's, we're talking about the scale, yeah. right? And that's what it's. Yeah. it's a small area. Yeah, it, yeah. one this on one kind of space. Yeah. Okay. In this breakout area right here. Yep. And then the meeting rooms we were talking about, because again, I couldn't quite find those either. Meeting rooms, um, was it the conference room? So there's a couple conference rooms. It's one here. Okay. Um, so that's a general conference room that can be either used by you know staff or um, if there needs to be um, a teacher with a group of students that need a space, um, they could go in there as well. And then there's another conference room by, a, by the, um, the general office. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Okay. And so when you're talking about, you know, Mike or, or whoever was commenting on the changes to the program, you're talking about things like we're not going to utilize the breakout space for one on one. We're not going to have small group reading. We're not going to have all of the things you'd be doing in those spaces. We're, we're not going to have the time in the media center or in the maker space. That, that's what you mean by changing program, things that are incorporated in the curriculum where and I think I read in one of the parts of the educational plan that in the schedule, so for part of the schedule, I don't know, it's one or two days a week, the classes, the classes will have time in the media center and the maker space, either jointly with a teacher and a specialist. That's kind of what you're talking about, cutting program. Yep. We wouldn't do those things. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Mike. Okay. So we wouldn't have the maker space time. We wouldn't have the media center time where it would be done in the class because i'm more of a concrete person here in terms of sure. programs that's what you're talking about you're saying yep. we put this maker space in here because part of what we're going to do is you know once or twice a week the classes are going to go there they're going to make something in the maker space with the teacher and, and the specialist and whoever else is part of that and same thing with the media center and with the obviously the band and the art and all that i, I get that and that, that now yeah. that's okay that, that's it, it basically more... changes the way we're educating our right. kids in some form or fashion Right. We weren't going to do those things. And so those were things that in putting together the educational plan uh, through that process were determined to be things educationally we wanted to do and the space was made to fit it. Correct. Right. I got you there. Okay. That, that's, that's, that's helpful to me because I, I prefer the visualization along 
along sure. those lines as yep. to what it is. And then the gym shows the two, the two basketball courts. Okay. I think yeah. That so that can be, yeah, the gym is designed. Uh, uh, if you remember, we went through all the different designs, but it's basically designed for one full size high school level court or right. two youth courts. If we do, right. you know, the, the divider. Right. Right. And we had talked about doing the two high school size. And we opted not for that. Correct. That would have been the, the largest option would have been right. two high school size court. All right. All right. I think those were my main substantive budget questions. And I, I think kind of, I, I appreciate your indulging my questions here. I mean, I think that, you know, in looking at this, you know, part of me would say, well, gee, if you can cut that, if you, that, you know, four or 5% off, um, that you needed to, if you had to, because of inflation, why not do it now? You know what I mean? At the, at the outset and cut it back by that much. But I, I think there's enough trepidation in everyone's voice that, and, and the things that we're, we're, we're spending on, we're not wasting it, right? It's not like it's, we're doing it for like a, a boat for the principal or something. So um, I, I'm comfortable with, with the budget because that's kind of where I was going that if we could cut in the future, shouldn't we just do it now? You know, I mean, take that four or five percent off, but it sounds like that would still be a a process that that might be better done at a later stage if necessary. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I personally am not comfortable having a project that's cut down to the bone, and you know, um, you know, I, again, that's just we have a we have a school here that's got to last us fifty years, and um, you know, if we start looking at at cutting things that will severely impact the operations and maintenance, even if it doesn't impact program, you know, that's something that I wouldn't be comfortable with personally. Um, you know, we may be forced into that by the market in the future, um, but to give ourselves no flexibility now, I think is too risky. Um, and so um, what, what in, in, in my mind is, is um, you know, may get us, you know, a million or two savings, but over the course of this, this lifespan of, of this building, you know, that's, that's peanuts when you factor in um, what may happen from an operational perspective or a maintenance perspective by being short-sighted here. Yeah, no, I, I, I totally understand that. And that's why I say I'm, I'm kind of coming around yeah. to a different perspective than I had maybe at the outset. I mean, again, there's obviously not a $10 million cut we can make here um, that would be reasonable. Right. Um, probably isn't even a no, what would five percent be would be like a three million dollar cut. So in construction, um, yeah. In yeah. construction costs. And that, that I, I agree with you, just given how how far it's been cut back already, I think it's it, it makes sense to stick where we are because we may well be having to make some of these cuts down the road. So correct. Um, and I have some other other um typo type things that I've noticed as well. Um, and I'll just pass those along uh to Lynn. Yeah, um, I don't think we need to go through it. The missing, you know, the, the misspellings and stuff we've identified. It's probably not appointment viewing. So I'm going to send you all um, my documents for spell check from now on. <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I will send you a bill. Yeah, <laughs> I, I think no, we heard uh, that right. That uh, Mike will. I don't know if I can afford that. Spell Mike. check and editorial check all of our documents. Thank <laughs> yeah. you, Mike. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's great. But at the end of the day, I still think we are we are talking about square footage here and, and supporting our schools moving forward. Um, and that is the most important part about what we're talking about here, especially with the pending items that we have facing our town about construction and the influx of students. So let's not forget that. Anybody else have any thoughts or comments? Okay, um, if not, I'll, again, I'll entertain a motion to authorize uh, left field um, to submit the uh, SD submission um, as noted or amended based on tonight's discussion um, and um, the MSBA. Anyone? Not all at once. So moved. Uh, so I have a motion from Tim Bonfati. Do I have a second? Second. All right, I got a second from Mike Weber. And running down the list, Jeff Marsden. Yes. Walt Kincaid. Yes. 
Mike Marcucci? Yes. Tom Herb? Yes. Mike Weber? Yes. Tim Bonfati? Yes. Anna Mayo Shabrook? Yes. And Leo Brown? Yes. All right, motion passes. All right. Um, Lynn, do we have anything else on the agenda for this evening? We do. We have a communication subcommittee update. Okay. Um, while, while we're doing that, um, just before we start that, um, um, looks like there, there is one more uh, question in the Q&A, but if anyone would like to ask a question from the public, we will take those if there are additional ones we haven't addressed this evening. Um, so uh, please put your name and address in the Q&A um, with your question or uh, let us know if you'd like to speak uh, and we will allow that as well. But while we're doing that, we will get a communication subcommittee update from Anna May. Right. Hi, folks. I've got a laundry list here to share with you. Um, so last Wednesday night, we had our third community conversation. We had about it was an inferno in Dale Street <laughs> in the cafeteria. And thank you to those who attended in person. And um, but um, Emily gave a great presentation on um, the ar architectural renderings and um, Mike Quinlan talked about um, sustainability and the environment and Jeff and Steve spoke about the educational benefits. So um, thought that was a worthy thing to do. And we've actually got eight weeks until November folks. So um, all hands on deck. And we've got some road shows coming up in terms of we've got the pins coming up and um, new in town. Um, Mike is going to present at new in town and and CPAC, we're working with them to get something on the books as well as PTO. I've reached out to Roberta at Council on Aging and hoping to schedule something over there as well. And um, I think smaller gatherings and um, sharing our information will be very effective and helpful. And um, we're working on a one pager um, at a glance sheet so we could pass out at these road shows and also Medfield Day that's coming up. We've got a letter to the editor being crafted um, from the SBC that Tim Bonfati has kindly um, agreed to craft. And um, that'll just basically be a summation of the, pro of the um, project and um, to be put in in the next couple of weeks in the, in the press. And um, we've got a series of video clips from notable meetings that are almost, almost, almost ready to share. And um, we've got about it with the um, OCPF, the Office of Campaign and Political Finance, we are allowed one mailer. And so we've got to think about that, but just um, that's, that's on our plate as well. And then we've got at least two more forms coming up, definitely one at the end of September um, regarding the cost, um, the project costs and tax impact. I think people are, are really aching to dig into that. So we're gonna have a form completely dedicated to that. And then um, Medfield Day, in the next couple of weeks, I'm gonna send out a sign up genius, hoping that some folks here will be able to help us cover the table throughout the day. And if you've got any suggestions or any input, comments, et cetera, pop me an email or call me. Thank you. Thanks, Anna um, One thing you mentioned, I just wanted to expound on a little bit. Um, um, was in, ter in terms of tax impact. So um, we've had sort of a, a, a budget discussion in the last couple of meetings. Um, and I have had some discussions with uh, Christine and, and her team. Um, and we should have that um, after they've got some things going on and they're consulting with um, bond advisors, et cetera. Um, so we should be able to have that, uh, I believe, uh, end of next week, right, Christine? That is correct. So um, that'll give us a clearer picture of where we stand. Uh, I know it's it's easy to target the uh, the price tag of the building, but the interest rate and and that is is far more <laughs> impactful on the uh, overall cost to each taxpayer. So um, hopefully, um, you know, the bond market continues to be favorable, and we can um, you know make good uh, good bond uh, coverage for this project. 
Um, so that'll be coming up once we have that finalized. Obviously, we'll distribute as best we can to the community, but also, as Anna May noted, we'll have a community uh, conversation solely on that topic so we can go to, into it in detail. Um, and as, as I noted, we'll be doing other meetings with the warrant committees, um, different subcommittees that are targeting different topics and cost obviously is one of them. Um, but site selection and water and traffic are all um, different subcommittees. Um, Bob, I don't know if everybody's familiar with that. Do you want to give a, a brief overview of that process? I think it'd be helpful for not only the people on this committee, but the uh, public that is listening in. Sure. Uh, thanks, Mike. Um, yeah, so catch a couple of my notes here. Well, initially, um, you know, as I said before, myself and, and, and prior to that, uh, um, Sharon uh, Tatro has been the uh, the non-voting member, but we've sat as a, as a warrant committee representative, as the MSBA requires, or the uh, a finance warrant committee member to uh, to sit on the on this committee, uh, and we've been monitoring activity to make sure that my fellow warrant committee members are kept abreast of information. As we come closer to the uh, special town meeting in November. The volume of information and the need to disseminate the facts, um, we've, we've worked on two fronts. The first is to expand the group to uh, a subcommittee um, made up of myself, Sharon, um, and Steve Callahan, and, and, and Jill uh, Richter. Um, and her, that responsibility, we, we've had five meetings set up three of which we've already held, one with the Board of Selectmen. A second we had with the group, um, the PAC group that is for our kids for, um, for the town. I may have the name wrong, but that's the group that's advocating for the Wheelock site. And then we had a meeting la last evening, days running together here, with the uh, school building committee. Um, all of those meetings are public meetings, open. Uh, the, the calendars are set and uh, have, have been disseminated and they're uh, available uh, on, uh, as recordings as well. So um, we have two more meetings set up, um, one on August 8th with the uh, school committee and the uh, second on September, I say, excuse me, September 8th. And then the second was September 9th with the, um, the advocates, the Dale and Dale group. So um, we're trying basically to get a, a uh, establish the main questions that uh, have been circulated, the issues that have been uh, generated, meeting with the primary people who have been involved uh, as a starting point and uh, what we're going to do, and that's with a, with a smaller subcommittee, but all participants from the Warren Committee are welcome. Um, following that, we have each member of the Warren Committee in, in pairs uh, addressing specific questions that have come about um, over the course of this discussion. So um, one is the MSBA process, one is the uh, site selection process, and other is the um, the questions that have come up with the uh, with the water issue. Um, the uh, another one has come up with the cost, of course, um, and um, one as well also with the uh, park and rec, because the number of questions have come up in terms of if this uh, project is approved, what happens to the Dale Street uh, uh, facility and property. And so we felt that was important. And another is with the uh, town planning to see how the uh, uh, town planning and the long range planning fits into this. Um, so um, really the beginning, the first five meetings are really informational. Um, they're not very structured. We're not looking for presentations. Uh, and frankly, we're not really looking to see it, what if new information is provided because it is available. But we want to address the questions that are coming from the, um, from the town people who ultimately are the electorate. And uh, one of the questions that came up 
um, has been, well, where do we go for a single source of information? And uh, with the many sources that are out there, and it's viewed that the Warren Committee, because we will ultimately take a position on the article when it's presented, um, as we do on all articles that come uh, for town meeting, whether or not to uh, support or to uh, recommend dismissal of that article. And the feeling is that we want to uh, develop facts. It's not opinion, it's facts. We're trying to develop those facts, disseminate that information so that uh, it's very important that, that Sharon Tatro has opened up a Warren Committee uh, email address. And um, if there are questions that we've started to receive questions um, on these quite that we're addressing with each one of these particular groups. And um, so we've gotten good input there uh, and using those questions as a basis for discussion. Um, and it ultimately, um, two weeks uh, or thereabouts prior to the special town meeting, we will have an open meeting of the entire Warren Committee, open to the public, where we will discuss this dissemination of the facts um, and discuss the article and invite public comment and discussion. It'll be a to be heard hearing, as I understand it. And then a week later, we will come back taking that information and the Warren Committee will vote um, taking a position on the article. Um, so that's a little bit of a quick summary, Mike, but uh, I, I think it's very important to think, Sharon has worked very hard at disseminating the information through a number of sources um, and sending out the information on when these meetings are being held. So uh, if there's any questions, you know, pl please let us know. But we're, what we're trying to do is just get information out. And, and from my perspective, we'll be successful generating uh, people to attend the town meeting and participate. Um, the success isn't gonna be measured by whether or not, which way the vote goes. The success from our perspective is, can we get the information out so people become engaged and involved and come to town meeting and, uh, and set their vote? Thanks, Bob, I appreciate that. Um, anyone else from the committee have any further thoughts? Okay. All right. Um, I have a couple of questions from Chris McHugh and Chris, I, I don't know what happened, why they got moved to answered, but I will, um, I do plan to address them. So, all right, let me scroll back to this. All right, so uh, next question from Chris McHugh. The MSBA statute also notes RE minimum square foot. The eligible applicant may make reasonable departures from the MSBA educational program space standards and guidelines with a prior written determination of the authority at their sole discretion. That such departures are consistent with the intent of 963 CMR 2.00 to provide adequate, safe, cost-effective, and programmatically sound school facilities. The space stand standards set forth in Table 4 in the MSBA Educational Space Standards and Guidelines may not necessarily be applicable to reconstruction, renovation, or repair projects. These standards and guidelines were developed by the authority for determining maximum size and cost related to new construction. So I guess that's not really a question, but um, duly noted. Uh, next question, how much time in the day and week is envisioned for use of outdoor classroom, including in winter, and what is anticipated funding for teacher professional development to guide best practices using outdoor classrooms? Um, Mike, if, Mike, if you want me to jump in, I can try to answer that. That would be great, Steve. I was going to say, I'm, I'm glad you're still here. Um, it would be perfect for you to answer. Yeah, no worries. So, so the, again, a great question. I, I would be honest and say right now it's probably hard to exactly calculate yet because we could be utilizing it more with the bigger space over at Wheelock. 
but I'll answer it in the, in the two parts of the question. So how much is it utilized? So uh, again, last year was utilized a great deal uh, because of, of the COVID situations. But even prior to that, you know, both grade level science units deal with the outside world. You know, perfect example is grade four spends a great deal of time with soils, rocks and, and landforms unit. So having them outside with hands on activity, you know, everything we've read shows that the more the kids can be hands on, the more they're going to internalize that. There's also, you know, a lot of project based learning. Um, what we call PBL learning adaptations that can be made, you know, when we have the space as well. But again, just from two years ago to last year with COVID, you know, the math, you know, Brenda Paraki, who's our math specialist organizing scavenger hunts outside, um, things like the walk-in classroom we've talked about, teachers use that frequently. I mean, obviously if it's winter time and snow, they're not using that. But also the Victory Garden that I've talked to, you know, Holly Caulfield, the principal, I think that the teachers are very excited about the opportunity to, to get their hands involved there um, and also to give kids real life experiences with that. As far as the, the second part of the question, um, again, the, the monetary units, like we everything we try to do, I think at Dale and, and I think in Midfield is, you know, we would try to do it without really making it cost you know prohibitive to the district so we would be using our half days that are built into our calendar uh, our curriculum meetings that happen monthly also our faculty meetings that happen monthly and also we're very fortunate because we have common planning time uh, for both grade levels and the specialists so those are all things that we use now for other things to create professional development opportunities for our teachers so really excited and as I said I think as Anna May said on the very hot day um, you know, back a couple last week or whatever it was, I think that, you know, that opportunity, that site, you know, that's behind your head in the picture, you know, really provides, you know, our teachers and most importantly, our students with, you know, a plethora of opportunities um, that we just don't have now based on the, the campus setting between us and Memorial. So I, I hope that answers it. But Mike, let me know if you want me to expand on that at all. Uh, that sounded great to me, but uh, wasn't my question. <laughs> so, um, okay, um, that was the last question in the Q&A. So unless anyone has any new business, um, I guess I would entertain a motion to adjourn. Oh, wait, before we do that, um, Lynn, where are we with our next slated meeting? No yeah. one are... Do you want to uh, talk about upcoming meetings? Yeah, just, a, just I think quick, you haven't found yeah. us. Well, I, you know, we didn't have another meeting scheduled after this, but maybe now is a good time to throw out a date and see if that works for everyone. Um, maybe and, at the I mean, end and, of the month. And, and I don't know sort of what's left on the agenda, certainly for this group, but um, that's I do it. Think that's we'll, it. We'll, we'll, we'll want, no, I mean, I mean, future agenda. Um, yeah. You know, uh, once we get past the SD submission, you know, we, we're going to have um, MSBA board meeting, et cetera. But I do think that this group will need to get together and, and um, talk through, um, you know, the town meeting and things like that. So, um, you know, I don't know what the right time frame is for that, but um, we look at, I don't know, maybe the beginning of October or is that too far out? I think don't we want to have a vote on the revised budget? Oh yeah, we can do that as well. Yep. So I would say um, sometime in in September, I would think before the I the vote next public. The, um, let me check my calendar. Would we always also talk about um, your findings of the tax impact and all, all that good stuff? Yep, we could certainly do that. Um, okay. How about um, January, uh, January, <laughs> September 22nd? Isn't that a little close to the public forum? Could we could do the week before? I know I can't do that Wednesday the week before, but I could do another day that week. I know it's a bit of off, off, our, off our normal day, but. What was our scheduled uh, public forum date? Did we say the 25th? That's a Saturday. No, we originally said the September 30th, but I think we're, mm -hmm. we're looking at the, going back to the drawing board. Okay. 
Well, if it's if it's that way, then we could do the 22nd. I just think we need a little bit of time in advance of the public forum. Um, do Thursdays work okay for people? Because I the week before I could do Thursday the 16th. Yes. That's actually a holiday, Mike. Yeah, I was going to say that's Yom Kippur. Oh, yeah, yeah, I was saying, yeah. Yeah. Well, 14th. I'm not up on my Jewish holidays. <laughs> sorry. Tuesday um, the 14th. Tuesday the 14th is open for me right now. Open. I, I see Tim's mouth moving, yes, so. <laughs> Fine with me. <laughs> the 14th is a selectman's meeting. I have I I can't do the fourteenth either. Fifteen. Why don't we keep it the twenty second if everybody can do it? So if we're going to have the public forum toward the end of the next week. That works. That's fine. All right, what was that, Lynn? Keep it the twenty second if we're going to do the public forum near the very end of the month. Okay. Could we look That's at our right calendars now. to talk about the, the public forum? Yes. That'd I be mean, good. yeah, to just get a date down, that would be awesome. So you're saying the 22nd for SBC? Yeah, we could do like the 29th or 30th for public forum. That's a Wednesday or Thursday. I don't, um, all right. I say I, I'd like to do it opposite. Like if we can. Well, what were you proposing, Leo? Yeah, I, I, just, I mean, I mean, I'd love to discuss the the outcomes of the public forum. You know, before we meet. I mean, that's when's we the switch, switch it. Then we could do public forum the twenty second and SBC the 29th, but um, we're going to be talking about budget and tax impact and all that. Do you not want to have a meeting of the SBC prior to doing yeah. a public forum on it? I would think so. Yeah, I, I agree. Third meeting? Sorry. I'm sorry to do that to everybody, but... No, no. Well, I guess we what could I'm do a about. meeting after the 29th, like on the on the sixth of October. As a recap for the community conversation. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we're going to need to meet in October as well, so we can certainly recap that. I mean, I would. I guess I would say, you know, if the 22nd doesn't work, and we think that's too close to the community conversation, then. You know, my alternatives would be the, the 14th or the 16th, and if the 16th is a Jewish holiday, um, I would propose the 14th. Could we, yeah, could we do the 14th as the SBC meeting and then the 22nd as the community for a conversation? I don't see why not. Would that work for folks? Yeah, you'll, you'll just lose Christine and me because we have a board of select meeting oh, on the 14th. Okay. But sorry. No, no, no. Feel free to schedule at that time. That, that's yeah. <laughs> we'll send One you the recording. For you. Yeah. Oh, can't hear you, Mike. I'm not saying anything. That's because I was oh, other saying, mic. I was talking to my daughter. <laughs> oh, okay. Sorry. sorry. I you no, I she's getting getting ready to go to bed. So she wondered if she could say goodnight before going to bed. Good girl. Told her I was almost done. Or so I thought. All right. So what did we land on? The 14th? Yes. Absent, um, absent Christine and Mike? Yes. Okay. And then the 22nd for the community conversation or forum, whatever we call it, for talking about project cost and tax impact. And then and are we uh, thinking another live, I think another live one like we did at Dale? Hopefully, yes. hopefully cooler temps. Please. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Hybrid. Yeah. Okay. That works for me. I'm putting it in my calendar. Awesome.
Thank you very much. And do we want to set October for October 6th? Or is that is that too far away from the um, community forum to have a discussion on it? Um, well, I mean, if we're meeting on the 14th, maybe we can discuss then. Or do you want to set that I think tonight? That he wanted to have a discussion on what occurred at the forum. Yeah. Um, uh, one uh, ten ten six is fine by me right now. We can tentatively set it for that date, and if we need to move it up based on what we hear at the public forum, we can. Sure. Okay. Yep. We can always adapt. Yeah, that's okay. all we had on the agenda. So. Okay, um, unless anyone has anything else, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So move, Jeff. Second. A motion from Jeff and a second from Leo. Everybody loves, loves making the motions for that, for that one, right? <laughs> All right, uh, so running down the list, Jeff Marsden. Yes. Walt Kincaid. Yeah. Mike Marcucci. Yes. Tom Herb. Yes. Mike Weber. Yes. Bunfati? Yes. Anna May O'Shea Yes. Leo Brum? Yes. Mike Quinlan also votes yes. Thank you, everyone. I appreciate all your time. Have Thank a good night. You. Thank you, guys. Ciao. Good night. Good night.